So just so we have a sense of who's actually in the room, um, how many people here are entrepreneurs? All right, all right, <clears throat> Mubarak. Um, how many people are aspiring entrepreneurs? All right, is anybody here an investor? All right, so entrepreneurs take a look around, take a good look at these guys. Uh, they're gonna be helping you answer your prayers. Um, well, I'm super happy about being here. Let me just give you a little bit of context. So, um, uh, so here's the story of sort of how I got here. Um, about six months ago, I wrote this article, um, which was an op-ed for Forbes called Entrepreneurs as a New Asset Class. And in the article, the basic idea was that investors should entirely forget about technology, market size, product, financials, especially when you're an early stage investor. My thesis was that the only thing that matters is people. And, um, and so, you know, and I kind of came to this distillation um, just by my own history of investing and just noticing that a lot of times, even the companies that we invest in, they never actually look like what we thought they were going to be originally. Their business plans are never the same. Um, and technology is essentially commodity in the software space. Whatever you do, somebody else can copy. So the only thing that matters is people and execution. Um, so I took it a little bit further here. And so I made the thesis and the, the, the claim that, um, in fact, what would be really interesting to reflect real investing behavior would be not to buy equity in companies, but to buy equity in people. So what would entrepreneur equity look like? If I put down a million dollars today to own your future income stream for the next, for the lifetime of your, um, of your career. Uh, so needless, needless to say, it was a very controversial idea and I got a, I got a ton of feedback on it. Um, some that said that I was a feudal landlord and overlord, and some that said other things. But I'll give you a sample of some of the comments that I got. So um, sort of the more fun variety was, oh, you invest in people? Well, I have this 12-year-old son. He's, he's an incredible baseball player, and you should look into investing in the future of sports players. Uh, please contact me if you know someone who's interested. So that was certainly one variety. Um, I actually got feedback like this, which is um, surprisingly how I came here. So. Um, I tweeted this out on my blog, and a guy named Fadi Gondur picked it up. Um, and he actually posted it on his blog. Um, so I think he liked it, which was great. And in fact, he invited me here to speak basically on the basis of this. So if anyone tells you that social media doesn't work and it's only for games, um, they're wrong. You can actually make interesting relationships from that perspective. But I think the, you know, the one question that regardless of whether you agree with the thesis or not, that everyone came to is, well, you say you want to invest in people, why don't you tell us what kind of people you're looking to invest in? What makes a great entrepreneur? And I figured regardless of whether you believe in the thesis that we should buy equity in entrepreneurs or companies, I think um, this is sort of a nice common denominator. So what I thought I'd do for the rest of the time that we have here, and we can do it however you like, um, is I would walk you through certainly some of the entrepreneurs that I've come across in my career uh, and to give you a sense of, you know, those are people that I'm pretty passionate about and I think actually embody some of the features that I think are abstractable to all entrepreneurs. Um, so I have some stories that I wanted to share, uh, but before I do that, I'm, I'm gonna stop for a second. Does anybody, by the way, have any, um, I'm always interested if you've seen models for people who are investing directly in people, does anybody here have any examples that they've seen that you think are interesting or worth bringing up? Okay. Well, it actually is happening. So I, um, I've actually met a number of people who made these contracts and bought equity in entrepreneurs. But um, all right, so I'll, I'll continue on and then feel free to ask questions or stop me. Um, a little bit of background on me though before we get started as to why I'm passionate about this topic. So my day job right now is I'm a venture capitalist. I'm based in San Francisco. I work for a firm called CMEA Capital. Um, and CME Capital is probably about a, a mid-sized venture firm. We run about $1.2 billion of capital, invest in a lot of different areas, and actually, I own all of our digital media and internet strategy and also our portfolio there um, and actually pioneered all of our seed stage investing. So there it's putting down money primarily on the basis of people, not business plans. Um, and so some of my portfolio companies, there's a company called Pixaza, which is um, an image monetization platform that Google invested in recently. Um, so we like to call them AdSense for images. I have a, a new search company that launched recently that I'll talk about uh, called Bleco. I have a company in the recruiting technology space called Jobvite. I have a consumer robotics company called Evolution Robotics. Um, and actually, my sort of, um, my investing background came from another firm called Garage Technology Ventures or garage.com. So there's a guy named Guy Kawasaki who's pretty um, all over the place writing books and, and such. And he founded what I think is the first startup incubator in Silicon Valley. Um, so I spent six years there 
uh, investing in over 150 companies, um, including companies like Pandora and Simply Hired and, and a bunch of others. But that's sort of how I got into the investing game. Um, and a few friends actually told me that you know, the only way you can lose more money than technology investing is investing in film. Um, so I started doing that too for fun. So I actually started something called the Film Angels, which is an angel network that invests in independent film. Um, very different from technology, but really interesting also just to see the analogies between investing in filmmakers and investing in entrepreneurs. I think they're both actually very analogous. Um, and then my background, if you go back far enough, I worked at IBM R&D for a while. I worked in Disney strategic planning. Um, I went to Stanford. I actually um, also am a guest lecturer at the Stanford Design School. Um, so that's sort of how I keep myself sane. Um, <clears throat> and also, um, you know, feel better about raping and pillaging during the day in my venture job when I go back and actually give back to the community. <clears throat> so let's go back to the question, the central question, what makes a great entrepreneur? At least what's my opinion of what makes a great entrepreneur? Um, so I had a, a few things that I wanted to talk about here. Um, so first, I think, is this notion of great entrepreneurs want to rewrite the rules. Um, does anybody here listen to hip hop or rap music? Any chance? All right. So the, um, for those of you who don't, the great poet Jay-Z um, once said, or once wrote, that um, he wants <clears throat> to take the future in his own hands. And he came to a fork in the road, but he went straight. Um, and it's interesting to me, I think a lot of the entrepreneurs that I look at, when they see a fork in the road, they go straight. They make their own path. And I think that's pretty indicative of some of the people that we've come across. And I wanted to give you an example of one. So here's a guy named Rich Skrenta. Um, he's an entrepreneur that I've invested in. And I'm, I'm actually an investor in this company, Bleco, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, but by all accounts, he is a hacker. Um, so actually, in the ninth grade, Rich Skrenta has the, um, if you look him up on Wikipedia, what you'll learn about him is that he wrote the first self-replicating internet a computer virus that was actually transmitted from PC to PC on the Apple II platform. Uh, at the time, there was no internet, so basically it was something that transmitted from disk to disk. Um, and if you ask him about why he did this, it's not because he wanted to make sort of um, do a lot of malicious harm to the world. The reason was that he saw, he saw a system, he found a way to exploit it, and by doing a minimal amount of work could get maximal outcome. And that's sort of what drove him to do this. And I think, you know, what's interesting about Rich is he's been breaking the rules for a really long time. So actually, he got paid to break the rules for a long time at Sun, where he was head of security and cryptography. So they actually used to pay him to go out and break their security on a regular basis. And while he was at Sun, he actually started his first entrepreneurial venture, which is something called New Who, um, which sounds a little bit like Yahoo, and it's on, it's on purpose. So I, transport yourself back to 1998. Um, there's no Google around. And the world of search at that point was really about edit, you know, edited, curated content. So Yahoo was really valuable because they had this massive index of um, internet URLs that they had basically said were authoritative on the web. Um, uh, Yahoo had thousands of people and a huge editorial staff to do this. Rich Screnta, on the other hand, had no money uh, and zero dollars and no employees. But he came up with the idea that, well, if Yahoo's so valuable because they have this giant curated set of data, I bet I could do the same without any people. Um, so he started something called Nuhu, which um, and entirely in a crowdsourced manner, he basically got a distributed workforce to do the work of what Yahoo editorial staff were doing, which is to say, this is authoritative content, this content should be included on any web search experience, and actually big, built a bigger index than Yahoo with an entirely free workforce. Um, the company was acquired by Netscape um, within six months. So, and actually, the crowdsourcing user-generated elements that he talked about there became the basis for the inspiration for Wikipedia um, and that whole crowdsource model of, of uh, human editors who weren't getting paid, who just wanted to contribute. Um, now, I actually met Rich at his next venture, which is something called Topics. Um, and Topics was really about disaggregating the entire newspaper business in the local market. Um, and when I met Rich, actually, I was doing diligence on a different company. And everyone told me that, well, if you're looking at this space, you've got to talk to Rich. He's the smartest guy in the room. Um, so when I did start talking to him, it was very obvious to me, given his background, that this is something that, this is a guy who turns industries around. Um, and so when he finally sold his company topics to Gannett and told me the next thing he wanted to take on was search, um, I said I was in. And I wrote him originally actually a $250,000 check. Um, and then we put in lots of more money later on. Fast forward now two years. And $24 million later, just last Monday, he launched um, a new search engine. And in this particular instance, um, 
Conventional wisdom says that Google owns the search market, that they have too many engineers and too much cash for anyone to make a dent. And even if you're Microsoft throwing $200 million a year, you can't really make a dent. Yet here we are, we just launched on Monday, we recovered in about 300 different um, publications around the world, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, you know, startups, startup aims at Google. And I think if we can even make a dent as a third search engine in this space, we'll be doing a very, very good job. So now, I won't talk to you a ton about Blecko, but what I will say is the reason we made the bet was because we've seen him rewrite the rules over and over again. And I think there's an opportunity to do something similar in search today. Uh, if anyone has any questions about Blecko, I'm happy to answer them afterwards. You know, the other feature that I wanted to touch on was um, that I think is really important for entrepreneurs is this ability to never say die. Um, you know, I think, I think of it almost like <clears throat> the Terminator movies, right, where you have Arnold Schwarzenegger who's been given one objective and he travels back through time to come back with one, you know, with one task. And no matter how many times you think you kill him and he's dead, he gets back up and he keeps going. And in a lot of ways, I think of our entrepreneurs as like the Terminator. Um, so the one guy, I think, who personifies this in a way that few do um, is a guy named Tim Westergren. Does anybody here know the company Pandora? All right, great, awesome. Um, so Tim, I think, is the CEO of Pandora, and I think a lot of people know Pandora now for a success story. Um, but the reality is the last 10 years of existence before 2008, it was a story of abject failure and repeated rejection. Um, and what's interesting to me about Tim now, um, knowing the success that he's had, is what he went through to get there. So when we first actually met Tim, it was in 1999, and he had an interesting project called the Music Genome Project, where the idea was, I'm going to make a social discovery engine so that if I know, for instance, that Saad likes music from Khalid, um, it would be really interesting to know that that music tends to, people who like those songs tend to also like My Hips Don't Lie by Shakira, for instance. Um, and so he was, a, he was actually a musician. Uh, he built this technology. He crowdsourced the whole thing. And then he decided it was, you know, it was Silicon Valley. It was late 90s that he wanted to turn it into a venture. He raised venture dollars from it. Garage, my last firm, put money in. And um, off to the races, he decided to actually apply this technology for businesses, primarily e-commerce companies. And the idea was, I'm going to sell to an e-commerce business, and uh, people like Best Buy and e-retailers will then use it to help up upsell their existing customers. Now, it turned out that was a horrible strategy. Um, and he spent three years, he actually blew through his cash within a year. He spent the next three years begging on the streets. He actually went to about 300 different VC meetings. Everyone told him, no, this is crazy, don't ever do this, it's a horrible idea. He stopped paying his employees, he stopped paying himself. And then he went, <clears throat> and finally about three and a half years later, he found one investor who was actually interested in saying, you know what, we'd consider this if you turned it into a consumer play. Um, so three and a half years in, he recaps the company, he fires himself as CEO. He brings in a new CEO who now runs, actually, uh, was an executive from Saturn, which is one of the car companies, um, and tries it again. And this time when he tries it, turns out it's actually starting to work a little bit. People want to listen to music on the internet. Um, and he's starting to get momentum and a little bit of a fan base, and then what happens? The recording industry of the US decides that actually they're gonna increase their royalty rates by 3x, um, in effect, killing Pandora and their business. Um, a business that's just finally starting to take off. So what does Tim do at this point? Does he give up? He actually decides to become a Washington, D.C. lobbying policy expert. Um, he hires a lobbyist in D.C., he gets all the D.C. law firms, he spends the next three years in courts and in Congress convincing people that in fact this action by the recording industry is going to kill an entire industry and it's a net negative for consumers. So he does this for three years, the company can't raise any more money because everyone thinks it's a huge liability. Um, and while he's doing this, something special happens. Um, in 2008, a new device shows up. It's called the iPhone. Um, and the iPhone is a perfect mobile device that's optimized for music. And turns out that people actually like to listen to music, um, not on the internet with their PC, but on something that actually they can carry with them. And with the iPhone, finally things start going well. He gets the RIAA off his back. They come to a compromise solution. And now, if you look at what people think of Pandora today, it's 48 million users who use it on average 11.6 hours a month. And they spent, they actually had their first profitable quarter last year, did $50 million in revenue last year, probably gonna double that this year. The number one iPhone app, they have you know, deals with car manufacturers and the like. Um, but I think what people forget is that if it wasn't for Tim's absolute unwillingness to die, um, he wouldn't have ever had this opportunity. So he's probably the longest overnight success that I've ever seen, 11 years in the making. 
I think the next feature that you know, I look for in entrepreneurs is this ability to empathize. Um, so we, I actually have guest lectures at the Stanford Design School a lot. And at the Stanford Design School, what we talk about is sort of a design, um, design thinking. <clears throat> and one of the first features of design thinking is always thinking about how can you get inside the head of your customer to really understand their needs so that you're not building technology for technology's sake, but to solve real problems. And I cannot tell you how many people we see in Silicon Valley today who do not do that. So I wanted to share a story of one guy who has done it, and I think who's done it well. And his name is Renaud Laplanche. Um, Renaud is a Frenchman. He moved to Silicon Valley um, after doing a lot of fun stuff, including uh, being on the French national sailing team. Um, and I actually met him in the context of his last company called um, Triple Hop, which was an enterprise search technology company that he eventually sold to Oracle. Um, and right after he sold the company, six months went by, his, his um, handcuffs came off, and he literally called me to the Oracle building, which was just across from Larry Allison's office. And he said, I have a great idea for a new, for a new product. Um, and does anybody here know what the peer-to-peer -peer lending space is? All right, so a few. So peer-to-peer um, -peer lending, for those of you who don't know, basically is the idea that why should banks be the only entities, financial entities, who can make consumer loans? That with the internet and with individuals, you should be able to pool capital uh, to be able to make consumer-type loans at a fraction of the borrowing interest rates and also to make a great interest rate for your investors. Um, so when Renault pitched me on the idea of Lending Club, um, you know, I was certainly, I thought it was a big idea, but it wasn't the first one, and it certainly wasn't an original idea. In fact, there were about three players in the market who had tons of venture capital, who actually had um, a lot of traction and brand recognition. Um, but the thing that actually stuck with me when I, when I heard the pitch from Renault was that he had zoomed in on one particular constituent's problem, and that was the investor, so the lender. So I think what really impressed me about him was the fact that he had gone into the idea and that essentially the head of an investor and told me the biggest problem with the existing platforms is that they just don't make lenders comfortable. Um, so when he started articulating the idea for Lending Club, he started telling me things like, well, how can we possibly create um, a way for lenders to be able to create a portfolio uh, across many, many borrowers so to actually mitigate their repayment risk. How do we start to look at things like where the actual lender grew up and that when we, make a, when we actually find a borrower and a lender match, to know that they actually came from the same hometown or went to the same high school, so they would actually start to have some social pressure um, to increase repayment rates. He started thinking about things like how can we repackage and create secondary markets around this whole idea of peer-to-peer -peer lending such that I as a lender can then go and sell my portfolio of loans out to um, anyone else who might be interested. And I think the interesting thing about Renault was it was that exact focus um, that really got him some traction. So I think back now that was 2007. Fast forward to 2010, they've actually originated about $170 million of loans to the platform. The average annualized return for Lending Club is 9.6%, which basically means that you're better off investing in Lending Club as a, um, a money market investment than you would in the venture capital industry for the last 10 years. Um, he actually owns 85% market share in the US. Um, he certainly raised a lot of cash, and he is now the entity to beat. And I think the only reason it, that he was able to do this, to go from last to first in the last three years, is because he really understood that the core constituency's problem, and he got inside their head, and he came up with a solution that really made sense. So I think the last feature I want to talk about in the context of entrepreneurs um, that I think is super important is just this ability to inspire. Um, so people say that you know, success is 99% perspiration, 1% inspiration. And I think that's actually wrong. I think it's more like it's 99% perspiration, but it's also about another 99% of inspiration. And you have to have both. And by here, inspiration, I think I mean the ability to inspire people to your vision, to your cause, for your customers, for investors to see the world the way you see it and to communicate it in an effective way. Um, and here for two examples, I thought I'd, I'd share something that's a little bit different from the rest of the examples here, which is I thought I'd share the stories of two entrepreneurs, social entrepreneurs that I know. So this, is, this actually is a picture that I took with two of these people. Um, this was a panel we did about six months ago about social entrepreneurship. Uh, and since then, actually, some of the people on this panel have really taken off, so I wanted to share their stories. The first is a guy named Salman Khan. Does anybody know the Khan Academy? Have you guys heard of it? Okay. So Salman has literally now become another overnight success because Bill Gates um, started telling the world about what he had been doing. Um, the story of the Khan Academy is as follows. So Salman Khan is a hedge fund analyst. Um, 
he works in Palo Alto, and he has some cousins that actually work somewhere, I think, in Chicago, or live in Chicago. And he decides that he wants to be a great cousin and actually help them learn. So trying to get over the remote you know, teaching problem, he decides that the best format that he could create is something that are actually be akin to online 10-minute video clips of him working out problems. Uh, and so he does this and actually starts to work, and they enjoy it. Um, and then one day he decides to put them up on YouTube because he says, you know what, um, this is probably the easiest way to share stuff. And turns out other people start coming and actually looking at his lesson plans. So fast forward a couple years. His site now looks something like this, which you can't really see here, unfortunately. But, but basically now it's, it's a listing of 1,800 plus videos that he covers, everything from trigonometry to calculus to the Geithner plan to venture capital, <clears throat> valuation and investing, pretty on, on all sorts of esoteric topics. And he's created what is in essence the first open source virtual school. Um, he has, again, about 1,800 videos that he himself has recorded in his little studio. He gets about a million students a month to show up there and learn from his website. Um, he actually has more traffic than Stanford, MIT, and all the Ivy League schools open source syllabi combined. Um, and one of his obvious core constituents now is Bill Gates and his son. Bill Gates actually decided to put money in from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And I think the reason, again, that Salman's been able to do this, he's the model now for what an open source virtual school looks like. And the reason is because he managed to inspire people to his cause. He financed the entire thing through PayPal donations. Um, so I think it gets you to the idea of what you can do if you really can hit a chord and convince people that, um, of your way of doing things. The other person I wanted to bring up here is a, a girl named Leila, who's the uh, founder of a company called Samasource. Um, so does anybody here or everyone here know what Mechanical Turk is? Do you guys know what that is? Um, okay, so Mechanical Turk is a, a marketplace put on by Amazon.com, which is basically a marketplace for micro work. Uh, so think of the kinds of work where I'd be willing to pay someone five cents or 10 cents to actually fix something. So maybe I want to update my contact information. I want someone to pay for that. Or maybe I want someone to be able to look at a broken URL. Um, well, Layla's insight was that, in fact, this micro work, while not all that interesting for, from a wage perspective in the US, could actually mean a very meaningful wage for people distributed around the world. So what she did was she actually took a lot of this work and she farmed it out to refugee camps in sub-Saharan Africa where people had an internet connection. Um, she farmed it out to places in northern Pakistan, for instance, where people were, where moms were working at home. Um, and you fast forward just a couple years. When I met Layla about two years ago, she was just, she had this idea. It was uh, just getting started. In the last two years, she's booked about a million and a half of contracts from customers that include Facebook, Google, LinkedIn, into it. Um, she's actually distributed this work to about almost a thousand person workforce around the world. She's raised $1.2 million in capital from Google.org and the Rockefeller Foundation, won lots of awards. She's got 300,000 people who actually care enough about Samasource to follow her on Twitter. Um, and I think she's created this movement. She's actually gotten people to quit their day jobs, bankers from places like Goldman Sachs and others, to come work for her, not with any promise of actually making a huge equity outcome, but just to make a difference. Um, and I can't go anywhere now in Silicon Valley without seeing her somewhere. Um, on a panel or at the TED conference or the Clinton Global Initiative. It's really amazing to, see, to me to see how much she's been able to do. And I think the reason is because she's been able to inspire. So <clears throat> let's go revisit the question again, which is what makes a great entrepreneur? And I think, you know, for me, the things that really stand out are the following things. <clears throat> the ability to rewrite the rules. Um, the ability to never say die like the Terminator. Um, the ability to empathize and see the world through somebody else's eyes, whether it's your customer, whether it's your investors, um, to really understand their problems, um, and the ability to inspire, inspire people to action, inspire people to your vision. <clears throat> so I, the only question I have for the people in the room here is, does this sound like you? Um, because if it does, I would absolutely love to meet you. Um, and here's how to get a hold of me. I'm at, uh, here are all my coordinates. Um, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sal. Does anybody have any questions? Someone has to have a question. Jim Hornthal, do you have a question? No. All right. Go ahead, sir. Um, so we haven't made a lot of investments in the Middle East, and I don't think... Um, 
I think the challenge for us, so we actually have, a, we're based in San Francisco, um, we actually have LP relationships in um, places like China and India, um, and actually in uh, Eastern Europe as well. But we haven't done a lot in the MENA region, and it's not because we haven't looked. Uh, I think the biggest challenge for us is that not having a presence physically here, it's really hard for us to vet um, entrepreneurs. That's the biggest challenge. We actually have plenty of models that we think we could transport from our existing businesses. So I'll give you an example. So we have a company called LiveOps uh, in our portfolio. Now LiveOps um, is basically, think of the JetBlue customer service model. They enable you to destroy a call center and to actually federate all the work that comes to a call center to moms um, sitting in their homes with a VoIP connection. Um, and LiveOps has actually built a pretty big service, a managed service now um, that serves does over hundreds of millions of dollars of business. Um, and primarily their customers and actually all their workforce, about 20,000 strong, are all based in the US. I think the live ops model actually would be a perfect model for the MENA region because you have so much labor that's actually sitting at home um, where half the labor force could be engaged in productive activities but for a lot of different reasons um, isn't out there. And I think there's opportunities to actually take some of those models and transplant them here. The challenge I think that we've had is just that physically not being here, it's a little bit tough for us to be able to find the right managerial talent. But we've started actually getting a lot of um, expat um, entrepreneurs from the Arab world who are thinking about coming back. And I think those are the guys that we're thinking about backing to do interesting stuff here. Yeah. During the process of uh, carrying out the testing of people, do you think that uh, mentoring them afterwards and helping them into reaching their goals is your goal? So the question is about mentoring entrepreneurs and how much of a role do we take after we make our investments. Um, I think it's super important. Um, and, it's, and what's interesting to me about the mentoring process is just that um, it's just super important for us not to make the same mistakes twice. And so the way we've looked at that process is we certainly have acted as mentors for our companies, but actually we think we've gone beyond that. There is just so much great latent talent who's done, who've done so many interesting things uh, in Silicon Valley. We actually bring a lot of them on as sort of our own expertise network to help the company with whatever, they, whatever paths they go down. So it's not just talent within our firms and the operating experience that we have, but it's also the expertise of people that we've worked in the past, people who've had big exits, people who work in the industry that we actually bring to bear for all of our portfolio companies. Um, so we're super active in terms of helping our companies afterwards. Uh, but I think, you know, we look at ourselves as trying to help solve their problems. And so if we don't have the right expertise, we spend a lot of time actually making connections with other folks that do. And actually making sure that we have some of those mentors and advisors and board members, in some cases executives, that we're bringing on when we actually first initially make that investment. Um, so again, they don't have to go through the same mistakes. We should all make new, new mistakes. And that's sort of our objective there. Sad, unfortunately, we can no longer take questions. We're running out of time. But okay. Sad is with us today and tomorrow, so you could connect with him on a one-on-one. -on -one. Thank Great. you very Great. much Thank you. for a very interesting presentation.